Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, may I introduce Rudy? Rudy is all the way from Florida, uh, Jacksonville. Uh, what's the city you're living in? Uh, Jacksonville. Jacksonville, right, I'm correct. And Rudy is a fashion photographer who have been fortunate enough to work with uh, many interesting designers. And uh, it's my understanding that uh, Rudy uh, has interesting career and uh, interesting uh, way of thinking about uh, fashion. And uh, we'll hear about his uh, credentials in a second. Uh, would you please introduce yourself and kind of tell us like, who, who you are, like, why do you do like, uh, uh, fashion photography? What's your distinction as the uh, person uh, spending career in that space? Okay. Uh, I started uh, a little over 40 years ago, 40, 43 years ago. And it was a result of uh, not able to find something that I really wanted to do. And uh, as a result of my father getting my interest in photography since I was a young age by giving me a Kodak 828 camera, uh, it was always there in the back of my head. And I actually uh, realized that by shooting local musicians, uh, models, and charging them, we're talking about, you know, the 70s. Uh, 40 30 dollars and after chemicals and everything else under the sun I actually would end up with twenty dollars fifteen dollars in my pocket to me I'm like maybe this is something little did I know that the more money that I actually made the less I would have in my pocket <laughs> well you got married at some point right yes but the, but the thing the, the, the thing about it is is that if it wasn't for designers to be perfectly honest with you i wouldn't be having this interview because i early because i came to the realization in my career that without these designers i wouldn't have one so my whole business model has been about the designers it hasn't been about the here take the picture and i nowadays you run a social media and you post it None of my stuff gets posted until after the designers decide what they want to use. But what is the uh, monetization strategy nowadays with the uh, social media? It's my understanding a lot of designers are not capable to sell their product or not capable to get distribution and uh, they're suffering. Uh, so it's tough for them to afford expensive and fancy uh, uh, photographer and uh, crew in production. And then it's a big gamble. So you, sometimes they do a lot of simple shoots and uh, hope that something sticks or they put all their money in one expensive photographer and uh, you know, hope that this will work. Well, the thing is, social media has cannibalized. Social media has exceeded what uh, the early internet tried, was tried and used by the uh, counterfeiters. Back in the day when modems were first introduced, it was not uncommon to find a representative from a sweatshop at the entrances of the media check-ins of the major fashion shows, handing out cards. And these cards would simply say, we're very interested in what you shoot, send us a photo and we'll send you $5. Modem a photo, $5. And what happened was is that the knockoffs, the counterfeit, clothing would end up in the in the stores before the designers had a chance to get their production run after the oh, shows. Interesting. Okay. So social media has kind of succeeded that, but at the same time, uh, made it more of a benefit for designers because a lot of designers, when they're starting up, they really have this conception that it's about the clothes. Very few actually study the industry to realize it's not about the clothes, it's about the brand. And being about the brand, everything has to be consistent. And that's where the bastardization comes in. Well, they'll use photographers, they will run up, shoot for nothing, or collaborate, which is a really dirty word because it really means I want something for nothing. And they go from one photographer to another photographer to the point where their Instagram, their, their websites, 
everything is inconsistent. So it's very hard to establish a brand without consistency. What I've done, and I'll point out an example. Uh, I shot for uh, Shah Ali Ahmad, Ahmad Contour out of New Delhi, uh, EK out of Chicago, rudimentary, rudimentary objects out of Chicago, uh, Global Island Treasures out of St. Augustine. With those, it's just a little, they're smaller designers, but they've grown. And they've grown by the simple fact that they, it took them a while to realize that they needed to focus on branding. So they cannot go to any other photographers after you, so they have to stay with you no, so no, to no, keep, to keep that, that uh, brand, right? That's not true. What's it's true gonna is... It's going to be a different feel to the uh, photography then, right? Right. But the thing about it is, when I first started out, okay, and it wasn't until I reached Europe that I learned that it's about relationships. It's not about sticking with a photographer, it's about relationships and a trust. Case in point with me, before I shoot any campaign, I have to see the sketches. I don't see the clothes until they're on the model on the day of the shoot. I don't care about the clothes. For me, the sketches really illustrate the energy and the vision that the designer put into the clothes. That's what I have to translate through my eye. Hey, uh, how the COVID time have changed the, your business or improve or uh, alter? Like what, what things new that you do now that you haven't done before, how do you think it will, will affect in the future? Like we are, I'm, for example, already got vaccinated, so I can feel I, I can get closer contact with other folks, but uh, still, I, you know. My second vaccination isn't due till this Saturday at 5 p.m. Congratulations. After that, you know, I'm golden, as they say. But the reality is that COVID really amplified the real problems with the industry. I'll take, for example, when I first started out in the late 70s, it was a no-brainer for designers to contract short runs in the garment district. What runs? What do you mean? Well, what I mean is a lot of up-and-coming designers do not have the capabilities of producing thousands of right. pieces. What they look and what they want to produce is maybe one, two hundred, what is their budget, mm -hmm. and they're able to distribute, okay, through the stores. That ended, that ended in, two, in the 2000s, where apparel manufacturing literally was taken over by the military, the Defense Department, and the apparel manufacturers that are in Puerto Rico and elsewhere within this country, the Defense Department has first priority. So a lot of the smaller designers are held where they don't get their collect collections completed till like two, three years later. You follow? No, but uh, it's okay. okay. Maybe the, the viewers uh, will understand There's what you're talking about. Manufacturing in this country, it all went to China. Okay. Okay. So uh, I was solicited by a company called uh, Paneri, which is Paneri, P-E-P-L-E-N-E-R-I, which is bringing in manufacturing cells and creating them throughout the U.S., specifically geared towards smaller de designers. Part of the problem is not really distribution. Part of the problem is that if you get, if you have something on your website and all of a sudden it's taking off and it's selling like hotcakes, as they say, how do you keep up with the demand if you if the manufacturing is not That's there. That's a problem. Most of the people don't have the problem. <laughs> and, and the thing is, is that with uh, Hilary, they've proven it through their alpha operations and then now they're going into the beta and then they're going to be opening up to accept orders from designers. And they have companies like Siemens and so forth behind them and working with them on to make this a reality. And they're going to do it in a way that is going to be affordable and really benefit the smaller and regional designers because that's a real problem. I mean, in, in Orlando, for example, uh, Prestige Contour, she has 
a small bank of sewers. But she's fortunate because uh, being Russian and in that community, it's really easy to get people who know what they're doing. As I say, the old world uh, ethic of workmanship. Do you understand? Okay. Uh, maybe. But she's, you... over, but she's overwhelmed. Something that you mentioned yesterday uh, strikes me as an interesting topic. You mentioned that a lot of designers choose to do their photo shoots in Cuba rather than in Miami, and you refuse to go to shoot in Miami, like Miami Swimwear. Can you elaborate on the subject of why? Okay, it's not a matter of uh, designers. It's a matter of Condé Nast, Hearst UK, the German publications, the Italian publications. The reason why South Beach was so desirable is because of the lighting. The lighting in South Beach is near perfect. The lighting in Havana, Cuba de Santiago, is practically perfect because it's, the closer you are to the equator, the better the lighting. Hmm. Interesting. So with, with all this innovation, fancy new cameras, uh, lights, and the technology and editing, it's still the natural light uh, still makes a big difference. Photography is light. This is something I realized and accepted and kept in my mind through my entire career. It came early in my career. Photography is light, light is photography. If there's no light, there's no God. <laughs> Period, no ifs, ands, and buts. And going with that, uh, that's the key factor with all photography. South Beach was desirable because it was the closest point to the equator that they, that uh, it was always desirable. Now that Cuba has literally opened up, and Cuba started to open up in 85, actually, when it made an agreement with the EU, initially the Spanish government, to, uh, to allow them to come in and renovate the tourism, renovate the resorts and so forth. So Cuba is not, you know, Cuba is not the greatest place on the planet to live because of its impoverished and so forth. But at the same time, it's becoming light years ahead as far as resort and tourism with Europeans and people globally because of the money sunk in to really make everything back to what it was a top notch. Okay. And, and if you haven't been there in the beginning and not there now, it's hard to comprehend because in this country, Cuba has been demonized because of the word communism. But if you really step back and look at the statistics, and this is not in defense of Cuba, this is a fact. Cuba has the highest percentage in this population of PhDs. They are well respected globally in, med in medicine and so forth. So irregardless of what people think, I have to commend Castro on one thing in pushing education, pushing it to the point to have that statistic. And that's all I'm gonna say. I, I, I certainly wouldn't agree with you. I have a few friends of mine traveling to Cuba for totally different reasons, and they go for the prostitution and uh, like uh, easy, like uh, you know, access and stuff. So look, I, I don't think uh, uh, me coming hey, from I, the country I... like Russia and Ukraine and uh, having uh, experience uh, the well, uh, like communist well, of Soviet Union uh, uh, when yeah. I was a kid, I obviously but, left a bad taste for anything to resemble the Soviet Union. The thing is, the thing is, is that I'm not drawn into that world. I don't go to Cuba for those reasons. Okay. Right, but you support them with your dollars. So basically, when you talk nicely about them, when you uh, put your money into this, when you spend your money there, then you, the, you, you the, supporting the system. You're giving them uh, uh, another uh, breath to continue what they do. Not really, because they have full agreements with the EU. And the thing about people don't realize is that I felt more watched. I feel more watched in Cuba than I've ever did in any place in the world that I've been. And that is mainly because of how they work, their food system, their food distribution system, that if you turn somebody in and it's proven that they did something wrong, you get rewarded with extra food rations. 
and and, and, as far, and and as far as me spending my money, I'm getting paid to shoot. Right, right. That's covered within their budgets. Gotcha. Okay, uh, let's switch the uh, question uh, to the uh, maybe uh, interesting story about uh, fashion photography. Uh, uh, maybe uh, like a sad story you have that uh, something will make people understand the complexity of the production. Maybe a funny story that will make our audience laugh and uh, enjoy your, your conversation. You such a storyteller. I'm, I'm pretty sure you, you might have one or two stories to share. Well, how I got into Europe, the European market was interesting. I would in 1980, I mean, in 1983, first part of 1983, I got a gold embroidered envelope in the mail. It was in both French and English, and it simply was inviting me to submit to a photo exposition by the CIAC, which is a very renowned photographic organization in Paris to be at the Center of International Contemporary Art. I didn't take it seriously. And the fact that they told, it was clearly written in the letter that everything was covered, all they needed was my work. In other words, I didn't have to pay an entry fee or anything like that. I took it as a joke and I sent them garbage. I sent them stuff that I thought was my worst. They loved it. <laughs> they loved it. I was in shock. I was like, you gotta be kidding. This stuff is garbage. And the moral of this story is that it taught me something that I've held on to today, which we talked about yesterday. I refuse to submit to being a glossy fashion photographer, which in essence is commercial fashion. And that's what it taught me. And from that why, point, why would you send uh, a garbage to because uh, I didn't talk to the people who offer everything for free? I didn't take it seriously. It's my sense of humor. Okay, I didn't take it seriously. I didn't think this thing was real. My gosh. Okay, this yeah. this is 1983. I'm sitting in the United States. I'm basically starting out. I'm like doing this and doing that. Yeah, I'm shooting for local designers and so forth. And then I get this thing. And I didn't take it seriously because I had no clue. I had no idea who this organization was. I see, gotcha. Okay, uh, let maybe you have, since you've been doing this for so long, a life hack advice to or people in the industry, maybe for a photographer, maybe for a designer, maybe for a model. Is there any advice that you can uh, uh, share that uh, kind of explain who you are, like what, what what can you do for uh, for the brand? What I bring is the a feel for the brand. I call it true fashion, not commercial fashion. Commercial fashion is really, you know, as I said yesterday, commercial fashion is nothing more than the art of perfection, homogenizing homogenizing the image into obscurity. Because the reality is that once the the images are put out and so forth. They go in obscurity. There's nothing memorable. I shoot true fashion, which really emphasize on the feel and the photo to be memorable. But what so, kind of advice you give them? Don't shoot the commercial. Shoot the true fashion. No, what, no. what, what can be an, uh, an advice? Like, uh, what's what's the life hack? Use true light system. Like, uh, like shoot in I Cuba. Shoot like, like, any like, advice that will make uh, whether photography better or designer better or model better. Any life hack to the fashion? All right, for a model, it's very important that the model understands if it's a woman or a young girl, that as a model, she's there to draw women into the photograph, to create, to, to generate the curiosity of who is she, which is part of the branding. As a photographer, it's very important that it's shot from a feminine perspective, and it has to come across as spontaneous, not something that's so staged that it's glossy, or is what I call the Vogue template, 
where everybody's trying to envision that, where the makeup, everything is so overdone into perfection because it's that imperfection that gives you the edge on being different and being effective. Thank you so much. Um, to close the interview, the first hope for maybe we'll have more. If uh, you guys will watch it and uh, give us comments, and, uh, you know, uh, already get some bookings out of it. That that will make us uh, maybe uh, want to do another one. Uh, so my question is, what's your social media like, and which one do you use, prefer, and why? Uh, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. Like how people will find you. Uh, the, those designs. Uh, to find to find me, you really will find me on Instagram. Instagram has become the standard for portfolios within the industry. Okay. And per my user agreements with the designers that I do shoot, my stuff is what what is posted is usually a year to two years, maybe four years behind than what they were originally shot. I abide by the standard that it's about the designer, that when I shoot for a designer, none of my staff, nothing gets posted by anybody without the permission of the, fa of the fashion designer or until they start posting what they want to use or they've already used as an ad and so forth. This is the, the respect of the industry because of... If you have 40 years of experience and you shot for so many famous people and so many amazing uh, campaigns, uh, like, how, come, like, how do you explain that you have less than a thousand uh, followers on the Instagram but do you hide do you delete them do you you don't want to be following like what's, what's the what's the reasoning why you've not been discovered with millions of years I don't pursue it like you don't have to pursue it if you have no, amazing stuff the people will come to you right you don't if, if you can pursue all, if, 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 if someone has no meaning right no nothing to say no matter how they will advertise that stuff they're still not going to get millions of views right but if someone is but talented if, and uh, like really like no no look at what they do and people love that stuff you, you don't need to pursue it. you just post like you can post an amazing picture and it will get discovered right not true not true not true the thing about instagram it's kind of gone the wayside of most social media where if it isn't spectacular sensational and so forth I shoot true fashion. My eye captures how it should, what, what it sees to make it look spontaneous and so forth. People will tell me and look through my, my work and they're saying it's, it's spectacular, it's this and that. But Instagram is really about people who frequent it are the youth. And we're at a stage where everything's become so homogenized that unless- <coughs> you, I'm sorry. Unless you have a set uh, name within the media, they're not going to pursue it. I have friends who shoot Baudour and Glamour. That's all they do. Mm -hmm. And they have 300,000 followers wow. because they're implying nudity and everything else under the sun. Yeah. If you look at my work, it doesn't imply any of that. So for me, for me, it's, a, it's simply a portfolio. Gotcha. It, it's it's not that because I get spell, spell, spell it one more time for the audience. What's your Instagram? R U D Y P A R I A S. Rudy Arias. Thank you so much. Rudy uh, P Arias. <laughs> P middle uh, and. Okay, I will try to put it in subtitles so you guys can okay. uh, have, have the spelling. And, of the and, and in and, and in closing, to my point, and I really have to bring this up because I think your your audience will find it very interesting. I recently shot a cover for Toby Rubenstein. It's called the uh, House of Faith and Fashion, and the website is House of Faith and Fashion, and. It's interesting because it really delves into uh, how people view themselves, their faith, and what they see through fashion. And it, it really, in my mind, explains a lot what's going on with Gen X and Gen Z and so forth. As far as what I just said about photographers that I know that have a zillion hits and so forth. But other than that, uh, of all the covers that I've shot, that was the fun one. 
and I felt really good about it. Thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you want me to bring Rudy again and uh, maybe like a weekly or monthly, let, let me know and I will ask him maybe if uh, those, even though he doesn't like the, the word collaboration, so, sometimes uh, when uh, maybe I need to find a replacement word for that, but when the artists uh, work together, uh, it, it basically uh, produces sometimes more jobs for everybody involved. Let me clarify collaboration. I do collaborate with up and coming designers. I do it in the way where they do it to cover my fees, not to cover my fees, but expenses and so forth. We come to a, a minimal user agreement, but I come in because I see the potential and I help them with it. And it's my way of feeding the system because that's something that a lot of people who've gotten up there who are well known rarely do well they'll just say hey this person has this this person has this i'll give you an example peter Lindbergh, uh his hair and makeup people made peter aware of a young photographer that they did some work with and they would wreck grave and this guy is going to go places Peter called him out of the blue and gave him advice and mentored him. Do you know and who that? You, and you mentor also a lot of people. Yeah. But do you know who that photographer was or is? No. Mario Tino. I, I apologize. I'm not that. Uh, kind of okay, Mario is, is a well-known fashion photographer. But basically, my whole point is, and like what I told you last night, purpose of my life. In essence, since I'm going to be 64 this year, I've come to accept that it's about leaving a legacy, and that's what I've been doing. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Rudy. Thank you so much.